We're here at the Detroit Auto Show with Raj Nair from Ford, who is the man in charge of a lot of really interesting stuff that the company's been doing. <laughs> Hi Raj, good to see you again. <laughs> good seeing you. Everyone's talking about mobility now, and I know, I know Ford uh, has had some big announcements recently. Um, it seems like a kind of perceptual shift in the company, that you're not just going to be building cars, you're going to be doing a bunch of other stuff. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, it's part of our theme of you know, moving from an automotive company to an automotive and mobility company. Mm-hmm. And, and certainly there's a lot of broad-based trends that we see, whether it's you know, the, uh, issues with urbanization, increased congestion, um, you know, increase in middle classes, kind of have even more vehicles on the road, increase in personal miles traveled. So you know, certainly the, the time is ripe for new mobility solutions uh, that are going to be required. And we see an opportunity to expand our business from what's well, a great business of, of designing and engineering and manufacturing and selling and servicing vehicles uh, to a lot of great customers, but participating in the broader aspect of personal mobility, right. um, which is um, you know, a much bigger business opportunity as well, mm-hmm. but leveraging our strengths in our core business to do that. Autonomy, I think, is, is one of the things that plays into that. And, mm-hmm. and um, you know, the, uh, something I find really quite exciting about that field is the way that uh, it opens up transportation to people who previously hadn't, were, were kind of excluded. Sure. People who, with, with visual impairments or, you know, the elderly. Yeah. Um, I, I guess is that, that's, a, that's a focus for Ford. With... Yeah, certainly the, you know, the overall aspect of safety is obviously a mm-hmm. strong focus. And, and, you know, 90% of... of crashes caused by human error, so an opportunity to reduce that, um, and that's a, a big motivator for us. But certainly that the opportunity you just mentioned as well of, of people, uh, whether it's the elderly, uh, people with disabilities, children, um, and enabling personal mobility for them in a very different way. And uh, I think the autonomous vehicle, you know, coupled with business models that are enabled mm-hmm. by autonomous vehicle, um, we've talked about ride hailing or ride sharing or or even you know separate from personal mobility, but even package delivery autonomously and what that enables. I think those are very exciting to that opportunity, and which is why we're aggressively pursuing that and have announced that we'll have a an autonomous vehicle targeted at at ride hailing, mm-hmm. ride sharing, and high volume production, not just a, a test fleet uh, in high volume production in 2021. Uh, and do you, so do you envisage that rolling, will it, will it be across the whole US or do you think that you will start in, will it be localized to, to some areas? It'll be localized to begin with and, and part of that is driven by the technology. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're talking about what we call SAE level four autonomy, yep. which um, for our technology, the way we're approaching it means it would be a geofenced area and a large area, so a major metropolitan city. Um, but an area that we have a high definition laser map of mm-hmm. that the vehicle then can use its laser sensors, compare to this map and understand exactly where it's at and what the things are, are around it. Right. And so operating in those type of urban environments, uh, metropolitan environments first, and then expanding beyond that. So you mentioned SAE level four. Um, and just a recap for readers, there's, there's five levels of automation. Um, your car is probably one or two. Uh, three is, is more hands off. Four. You, you just tell it where to drive and it takes you there. Mm-hmm. Um, Ford said that you're, uh, it's not going to pursue level three mm-hmm. and you're going to skip straight, straight to level four. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about that. And, and a few other companies are doing it, but we see some other OEMs still think that they can, they can make that work. Right. So, you know, we've been working on this, on this project for 10 years, mm-hmm. so I have quite a bit of experience, um, you know, both in terms of technology, but also a little bit of human behavior yep. and how it responds. And... So within the levels that we talked about, level four means within the area that I just talked about, that urban environment, the vehicle is so autonomous that you actually don't need a steering wheel, brake pedal, accelerator pedal. Mm-hmm. That's how robust the system needs to be. Um, level two are driver assist technologies where the human is primarily in control. Um, in, in a layman's terms, level three means the vehicle is autonomous, but it may need to hand back over to you in certain situations right. in an appropriate period of time. Um, the issue is that term appropriate period of time. Mm-hmm. Um, human nature, when you get to the high, these high levels of automation, you, you start inherently trusting it more and more and more. Um, and you start losing situational awareness more and more and more of what's actually happening in the traffic around you and in the environment around you. And so the ability for the vehicle to hand back over an appropriate period of time for you to say, oh, okay, I understand what's going on, and I understand what I need to do to take evasive maneuver, et cetera. 
that period of time becomes longer and longer the higher level automation that you have. And presumably it's a situation where, I mean, the reason these driver assists are, you know, better at many tasks, stability control and traction control, you know, are better at judging those things than a human, so... In some ways they are, but, um, you know, the human driver is still a pretty amazing piece of equipment <laughs> gener or engineered by Mother Nature. And so we're certainly not at a point in level three that, that we'd be w willing to say get rid of the wheels, get rid of the steering wheel, get rid of the, the brake pedal, etc. There needs to be human backup. But that backup is not very reliable if they, they're not situationally aware. Right. Now you could add technologies to make sure that they're aware, right? You could sense that their hands are on the wheel, you can use facial recognition to make sure they're, they're looking outside, you can you know, scan case, eye tracking. tracking. Yep. The problem with that is then you've introduced um, very expensive autonomous technology, mm -hmm. you've introduced very expensive tracking technology that frankly is very annoying. It's gonna be constantly telling you, hey, you're not paying attention. And then for the consumer, you're going to be, well, why did I pay all this money because I thought the vehicle was going to drive itself, right. and all it does is bug me to tell me that I'm not paying attention. And so that, that area there uh, can, can be an area that can be dangerous if the situation, situational awareness isn't there for the human to take over an appropriate time, or it could be very annoying. Right. So for us, our focus is to continue to work on driver assist technologies, mm -hmm. and the new F-Series we just um, revealed, we do have pedestrian detection and automatic braking and uh, our adaptive cruise control now is full stop and go so can work in, in traffic jams, etc. But we're very conscious of this humans becoming over-reliant mm -hmm. on technology that's not robust enough to completely replace right. the human driver, which is why we're focused on what does it take to get to level four. Mm -hmm. And so if you start with the problem of, hey, there is no backup, human backup, you have to be robust to all of these scenarios on your own as a technology for an engineering team that really focuses us. So that's why we're focused on level four. 2021, we'll start to see those vehicles in some markets, but you won't, customers won't be able to buy them. Yeah, and, and part of that is it's still a very expensive technology. Right. You know, these sensors are very expensive. The, the processing capability on the vehicle will, will have some expensive computing technology on it. Does, um, does liability play into that as well? If, if Ford owns and manages the fleet, it's easier for you to self-insure than than individuals, or is that not so much of a... That hasn't been as much the primary driver as it's been the, the business structure um, for a ride-hailing service. Mm -hmm. A big portion of that business structure is the driver. Right. Uh, for package delivery, uh, a big portion of that business structure is the driver. And so for a business, if you can eliminate the driver as part of your business structure, um, even then an expensive autonomous vehicle makes business sense. Mm -hmm. so, Presumably because it's, in, it's being utilized... It's a Many very high a utilized asset, and it's, it's someone you are paying to drive. And obviously in personal use, most of us are not paying someone to drive for us, right? right. So the, the business equation to be able to afford an autonomous vehicle and have it make economic sense um, is probably more challenged than for a business to want an autonomous vehicle to put into a ride-hailing service or to put into a package delivery service. Right. Now, eventually over time, as um, you know, the technology gets more efficient, the costs come down, and, and the economies of scale go up, uh, we certainly anticipate that personal use autonomous vehicles will come into play as well. We just see the initial introduction coming into some of those business opportunities. Right. Can we talk about electrification? Sure. That seems to be, uh, seems to be a big thing at Ford now. Um, you know, it's been a big thing for a while. We've but some big announcements recently yeah. about, about um, you know, electric Mustangs, uh, or sorry, hybrid Mustang, hybrid F-150. So I assume we'll see hybrids across the entire Ford line, maybe with the exception of, of the GT. <laughs> and who knows even there one day? Um, I, I think you'll see certainly an increased prol proliferation across the majority of the lineup. Mm -hmm. And the way we're approaching it is making sure that with electrification, we're actually giving customers more of what they desire in the vehicle they're selecting. Mm -hmm. um, and that it's not a compromised trade-off. So right. for the F-150, we're talking about you know, um, great towing capability. Uh, we're actually and the incremental opportunity for a mobile generator at your work sites. Um, for the Mustang, right, we're talking about, you know, v very much V8-like performance, but uh, even more torque at the low end. It, it seems like, it seems like for both those applications, the, the, you know, huge tidal wave of torque you get with an electric motor is perfect. You know, your the Mustang will presumably dominate at the drag strip, and, you know, the F-150 ha will have that low-down grunt without needing a gigantic diesel. Yeah, obviously the electric motor is generating, you know, immediately maximum torque at you know, zero RPM, a very flat torque curve, uh, and couple that with the, uh, the internal combustion engine and the, and the hybrid, right? And 
Um, and then plus that, you get the great fuel economy. So it's uh, win, win, win. Do you think that will be um, in combination with uh, continuing with EcoBoost, or do you think maybe um, we might see a return to to naturally aspirated engines that are maybe tuned for sort of the top end and then you talk <coughs> fill with, with the electrics? No, I think you'll see both. Okay. I think you'll see some of the engines that are naturally aspirated and, and perhaps, you know, different cycles, Atkinson cycle. I mean, we have that right now. Um, but in, in the applications like we're, we're, we're talking about, an EcoBoost is a great, EcoBoost hybrid match is a great matchup. I, I could imagine a GT350 with like a two liter flat crank Voodoo that revs to nine thousand, and then with some batteries to. Oh, the to flat do the crank in a in a in a two liter. That would be an interesting engine. It would, yeah, would yeah. sound amazing. Yeah. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about is, is the Ford GT. Um, mm. You know, I'm a huge sports car <clears> fan. Um, I think I think the World Endurance Challenge uh, Championship and and IMSA Series here are the two best things in racing. You guys have been been doing quite well in there. Obviously, the the Le Mans winner. Sitting outside. Yeah, it's um, right there in all its glory and um, all the dirt from the track. Yep. <laughs> I, I, it's taken me a while to work out. Like, did, did you switch the body the body panels? Because mm -hmm. I'm sure I saw that car race at Watkins Glen, but apparently that might the be chassis the chassis raced again, but so, the body right. panels are from. So, the, so you took the panels off because obviously it's that, that's its Le Mans winning yeah, post exactly. grime, yeah. and then and then stick them back on for the shows. Yes. So production's been extended. Yeah, so, we uh, you know originally announced um, we were building 250 a year for two years. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've now announced that we're extending that production another two years, so a total of a thousand vehicles. Is, is that whole run? I remember there was an application process, and there were many people waitlisted. Mm -hmm. um, so, is there? Did you have enough people on the waitlist that the full thousand is, is spoken for? So, when we announced a um, production of 500 vehicles, we had 6,500 mm -hmm. plus applications. Um, so, we accepted 500, and then we put 250 on waitlist. Um, and we've obviously announced another 500 vehicles. So, those 250 on waitlist are basically now confirmed. Um, but there are 250 vehicles that are not allocated yet. Right. And so we will reopen the application process and uh, the people who had the, you know, the other 6,000 applications will get to update their application. They can update it now, actually, um, but so we'll if accept you, if new you didn't applications. get one, now's your time. Yeah, yeah there's still a, a chance for uh, getting one. There's 250 that aren't allocated, and, and certainly there are a lot of people here at the show that are excited about that because <laughs> they've pulled me aside and said, hey, I, I want to apply. So uh, the, the detailing on that, guy, there's just some... The, this is really nerdy, but the door hinge, mm. that, that kind of piece of machined, yeah, it's, forged it's a piece aluminum, of art. Yeah. Is, is absolutely stunning. Yeah. It's, uh, and very lightweight, so mm -hmm. it's very efficient. So um, there's a lot of, uh, when, when you see the vehicle, particularly at the assembly facility, um, up with Multimatic, and you can see some of the detail of parts that are covered up, right? Um, there's a lot of art underneath the skin there. Are there things you're learning on that car that we might see trickle down to, to the more attainable Ford range? Yeah, absolutely. Certainly on the carbon fiber front, mm -hmm. um, obviously it's a primarily carbon, almost all carbon fiber vehicle uh, with some limited structure. So we'll see some of those lessons coming into mainstream production with increased use of carbon fiber. On the aerodynamic front, some of the aerodynamic tools that we use to design the vehicle um, and the simulations that we use, we really came in spot on with how the actual vehicle performs. So those aerodynamic tools are already in place in some of our Ford model programs. We're using those. And certainly the, the learnings of, of getting that much horsepower out of a 3.5 liter EcoBoost and the 600 plus horsepower we've got will... And, and making it reliable enough to, to oh, run for 24 hours. Well, oh. I, it, running for 24 hours, but you know, there's some aspects of the production vehicle duty cycles even harder mm -hmm. than the 24 hour race cycle. And so both of those learnings coming into uh, future EcoBoost engines. So. Thank you so much, Raj. It's been, a, it's been fascinating to talk to you. Appreciate it. Thanks Thank you. Lot.